during the 1940s, military technology experienced an almost unprecedented leap in capability, especially when it came to aviation. Many aircraft would be developed during the Second World War, rapidly eclipsing late 1930s holdovers, especially when jet engines began to mature to the point of useful service. The ME-262, or the Meteor, or the P-80, among others. However, the United States Navy decided to be a tad bit more conservative when it came to jet development. A request was put together for a twin-jet fighter in late 1943, which eventually evolved into the McDonnell FD, later FH, Phantom. That said, an earlier requirement was put forward in late 1942. This is commonly attributed to Admiral John McCain Sr. and entailed a mixed propulsion fighter. Still two engines, but instead of two jets, it would be a mix of old and new. A traditional piston engine in the nose and a new jet engine in the tail. A handful of options were put forward, but only two really went anywhere. One was the Curtis XF-15. This aircraft wouldn't fly until 1945, and ultimately only three prototypes were built. It came too late, as the Phantom was finding its legs by this point. This has left the Curtis proposal largely forgotten along with foreign designs of a similar nature. While the other proposal did end up seeing limited production, the topic of today's video, the Ryan FR Fireball. While this aircraft isn't exactly famous in the modern day, it does eclipse its competitors in actually seeing active service. Admittedly short active service, as the mixed propulsion concept went the way of the dodo. Nonetheless, the fireball was an important step in the development of naval aviation. A dead end, perhaps, but one that needed to be tested. So in today's video, we'll be looking at the fireball's development and service. Let's begin with that initial requirement, as everything goes back to this in the end. That proposal was something of a throwback in a way. If you watch my recent Vindicator video, you'll get what I mean. In the development of that aircraft, the Navy insisted on a biplane counterpart. There was a certain leeriness about operating monoplanes from carrier decks, namely that these aircraft required a longer takeoff run and had a higher landing speed. A similar concern applied to jet fighters in 1942 when jet engines were in their infancy. Early jets were notorious for having sluggish acceleration. As the story goes, the Navy was justifiably concerned when it came to operating from a carrier. Much like the earlier monoplane concerns, this was a longer takeoff run. Workable on land, but a bit of a problem on a limited carrier deck, even the larger Essex and Midway. To some extent, this could be countered by the use of catapult-assisted takeoff. However, it remained a concern for Navy planners, as did the general unreliability of early jets and their nature as fuel hogs. That was a double whammy for the Navy, because it increased the risks on the pilots. With all these factors coming together in a reluctance to commit to a straight jet-powered aircraft, at least at first. Thus, you had the late 1942 proposal for a mixed propulsion aircraft. As the theory went, the aircraft would primarily use the piston engine for most operations. It was more fuel efficient, more reliable, and simpler to operate. So for cruising or low altitude flight, this was the superior option. Whereas the jet engine was better at high altitudes 
and could be kicked in for combat, either alone or in conjunction with the piston engine. Some sources will cite using both engines for takeoff with the jet shut off after getting airborne. Regardless, nine companies would put forward designs for the initial requirements. Of these proposals, the one from the Ryan Aeronautical Company was viewed as the best. An interesting result, as Ryan was hardly known for building combat aircraft of this nature. Although it certainly wouldn't be the first time a company broke out like this. In any event, Ryan received authorization on February 11th, 1943 to build three prototypes. Despite their lack of experience in this area, Ryan's engineers proved adept at their work. They would have the first prototype ready for flight by June 1944 with the first flight itself coming on June 25th, albeit without the jet engine actually installed. This would soon be fitted, while the other two prototypes took to the sky later in 1944. It was during this testing that some flaws with the design did crop up. Two issues were particularly notable at this point of the testing. The first was a relative lack of longitudinal stability. The two engines made calculating the center of gravity difficult, and this evidently became a problem in flight testing. With a new larger tail fitted to counteract this problem. The second issue, meanwhile, came with the wings. These proved to be a bit too weak. Specifically, the first prototype crashed on October 13, 1944, when the wings collapsed after reaching their compressibility limit. That is, getting too close to the speed of sound. Ryan doubled the number of rivets in the wings in an attempt to solve this problem. Now, these issues were identified in early testing. Operational testing would actually reveal a couple more problems. First and foremost, the piston engine had overheating issues. This could be fixed with new electrically operated cowling flaps that provided more air intake and helped cool the engine. The other issues came in the landing gear. The nose wheel had to be lengthened by about three inches, even though this was a patch job. Pilots had a distressing tendency to break fireballs on landing due to their tricycle landing gear. It was an adjustment for pilots in landing, especially with catching the tail hook. Despite these problems and all three prototypes ultimately crashing, production went forward. The first order came through on December 2nd, 1943, for 100 FR-1s, before the first flight. A much larger order came on January 31st, 1945, for 600 more fireballs. This was a tad optimistic, of course, and nowhere near that many would be completed. But that's a topic for the service portion of the video. Let's take a quick look at the specifications of the aircraft first. When the FR-1 entered production, it was powered, as noted, by two different engines. A traditional Wright R1820 radial engine in the nose. This output 1,350 horsepower, whereas the tail-mounted jet was a General Electric J31 that provided 1,600 pounds of thrust. With its air intakes fitted in the wing roots where they're actually a bit difficult to see. Together, these two engines could get the fighter to around 404 miles per hour or 650 kilometers per hour. With a service ceiling of 43,100 feet or 13,100 meters. The aircraft they powered was about the same size as an F-6F Hellcat, 
a length of 32 feet 4 inches, 9.8 meters, and a wingspan of 40 feet or 12 meters, with a maximum takeoff weight of 10,595 pounds or 4,805 kilograms. Compared to a length of 33 feet 7 inches and a wingspan of 42 feet 10 inches on the Hellcat. The weaponry, meanwhile, was on the lower end for the time. Four 50 caliber machine guns compared to the more standard six. Though the fireball could also carry up to eight 5 inch rockets or two 1,000 pound. 454 kilogram bombs. In any event, that wraps up this section. Now for service, such as it was. The fireball burned bright, but it also burned quick. The first production model, FR-1, was delivered to the Navy in March 1945, specifically to VF-66, which was formed specifically for operating fireballs to the point their nickname became Firebirds. While most of the squadron trained ashore, three of their fireballs were put aboard USS Ranger on May 1st, 1945. Ranger was by this point used for training duty, and those three fireballs certainly needed it, being as two of them ended up damaged in landing accidents. Although these were relatively minor, with one hitting the crash barrier and another having the nose wheel collapse. I've seen reference to fireballs in later accidents breaking in half because of a botched landing. Regardless, the VF-66 fighters mostly remained ashore. They had qualified and become operational by the end of summer 1945, but they never went to sea outside the testing on Ranger. Because shortly after the squadron was combat ready, Japan went and surrendered. As a result, VF-66 would be decommissioned and the pilots plus fireballs transferred to VF-41. Around the same time, the majority of fireball production was canceled. The United States was at peace and drawing down. Moreover, the Phantom and other early jets were coming into their own. The Fireball wasn't seen as necessary anymore, so only 66 production models would end up being built. And those 66 aircraft would be used entirely for testing purposes, primarily from three escort carriers. USS Wake Island, USS Bairoko, and USS Badong Strait. This testing was largely successful, with some accidents sprinkled in. If nothing else, this did demonstrate a niche for the Fireball in operating from the smaller flight decks. Though I do really need to emphasize potential here. A lot of the escort carriers were put on second-line duty, in their own regard, so this option remained limited to testing. Testing that includes a bit of a disputed point. On November 6, 1945, a fireball flown by Ensign Jake West was attempting a landing on USS Wake Island. On his landing approach, West's piston engine died. As the story goes, he was able to kickstart the turbojet and manage a safe landing. Although he only barely caught the last arrestor wire, narrowly avoiding an impact with the crash barrier. Some sources will argue this as the first jet landing on an aircraft carrier, even if an unintentional one. Others will argue there was still some power in the piston engine, so it wasn't a fully jet landing. With that honor going to Winkle Brown and his de Havilland Sea Vampire on December 3rd, 1945. Either way, West managed a landing worthy of respect. Unfortunately, the fireball would continue to be dogged by issues in service. 
when VF-41 shifted to Bairoko in March 1946, pilots continued to wreck the nose gear. Those were embarrassing, but generally didn't harm the pilots. Three pilots would, however, be lost. One collided with a target banner and crashed. Later in 1946, the squadron commander had his wing snap off, causing a collision with another fireball. Both pilots would be lost. And in 1947, the squadron, now called VF-1E, shifted to Badong Strait. Sadly, by this point, the fireballs were wearing out. The airframes proved too light to withstand repeated carrier operation, and most were showing some form of structural issue. As a result, in August 1947, the aircraft were pulled from service. A very short time in service, but about the best that could be hoped for. These aircraft, innovative as they were, remained a legacy of a conservative approach to jet propulsion. The Phantom and its successors would be the way forward, leaving the fireball a relic and curiosity, with only one survivor at the Plains of Fame Museum in California. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.